Hi everyone, Mrs. Below here. In this video, I just want to go over the highlights, the really important points, all of the topics that you are going to see on your chapter two test. So the first thing I want to talk about is picket fences. So there will be two of these um, on the test. Um, again, this was in that first review assignment, the very first assignment you did for this chapter. Again, with a picket fence, you always want to make sure that the units here and here are the same so that they cancel. And then whatever you have above and below each other is equal. For example, let's say you're starting with, I don't know, 15 minutes and you needed to get that into seconds. I'm doing just a really short, simple picket fence. Um, for units of time, this is something that you would intuitively know. Um, for example, I know 60 minutes, or I'm sorry, I know I want to get minutes into seconds. I know that 60 seconds equals one minute. For other um, things that you're not familiar with, I will provide these for you. You know, like there are 2.54 centimeters equals one inch, something like that I wouldn't expect you to memorize, so I would provide that to you. So you have something like this, inequality, okay, this equals this. You're starting your picket fence with what I give you in the problem, what you're trying to convert. Whenever you are doing a picket fence, always, always, always make sure the units here and here match up because you want them to cancel out. Well, if you put minutes here and you're looking, oh, okay, looks like this equality says one minute, and that is equal to 60 seconds. So again, these two need to be the same, so they cancel. And these two above and below each other need to be equal. And you just continue your picket fence until you end with the unit that's not crossed off that you want your answer in. So that's just a little recap of picket fences. Uh, next, I want to talk about scientific method. So scientific method, there's a lot of different components to it. Usually it starts with an observation of some sort which generates a question. Um, and you want to answer that question in the form of a hypothesis. And once you have your hypothesis, you're probably going to test that in an experiment, which is what we do a lot in this class, well, because it's chemistry. And what's important to understand is the difference between um, independent variable, dependent variable, and your control variables. So the independent variable, this is always what you are going to be testing. So maybe it's, I don't know, a name brand of, I don't know, um, fertilizer or up for a plant. Or maybe you are testing temperature or maybe you're testing, I don't know, something. Whatever it is you're testing, that's your independent variable. And hopefully... The dependent variable depends on the independent variable. And I always remember the dependent variable is what you measure. So whatever you're taking measurements of um, that you're hoping to see a change in, um, you're hoping to see a change in the dependent variable in response to changes in the independent variable or just testing the independent variable itself. Control variables are things that you want to keep the same or constant throughout the experiment. You know, if you're testing something with like, let's say plants, um, you'd want to make sure that if you're testing fertilizer, that there's nothing else that can affect the plant's growth. If that's what you're measuring, maybe you're measuring the plant height, that's a dependent variable. You would want to make sure that sunlight, water, 
um, the type of plant, the soil, you'd want to make sure that all those things are the same throughout your experiment so that only what you're testing is impacting your experiment results. Next, I want to talk about quantitative and qualitative data. So quan and qual, just to abbreviate. So these, this is just two different types of data. Now, how I always remember it is quantitative, I think quantity. So I think like how much. So that has to deal with um, numbers. So any type of numerical data that you're collecting, which is what we do a lot of in this class, and most sciences in general, um, is quantitative data. So it's the quantity, it's how much you're you know, collecting data on temperature in degrees Celsius, plant height in uh, centimeters, whatever it is, uh, mass in grams, that would all be quantitative data. Versus qualitative data, I think quality. So I think the quality of something, it is descriptive. Um, things that you can't like collect in terms of like numerical data. Um, maybe the smell of a chemical experiment, maybe the color of the leaves, um, color being a big one, maybe the texture of a metal. Things like that would be qualitative because you're describing that data in words, not numbers. All right, next I have scientific notation and significant figures. So scientific notation is when you have um, some type of a number. I'm going to make it up 2.13 times 10 to the, I don't know, um, fourth power. So this is scientific notation. This method we use to represent very big um, or very small numbers without having to write out all of the zeros. So for example, um, 2.13 times 10 to the fourth, this as a um, regular number would be if you moved one, two, three, four spaces to the right. Um, remember, if this exponent is positive, that means it's a really big number. So this number, if I were to actually write it out, would be 21,300. And I can actually show you that in the um, calculator. Um, hold on, let me find my calculator. Sorry, I was having technical difficulties. So remember in your calculator you can enter in numbers as scientific notation. So I'm just going to review that. So 2.13, so you enter in the number. Again, in scientific notation, it's always in this format. There's only a number in the ones place, and then you have your decimals after that. You should always have only one number here. You shouldn't have two numbers, just one number in front of the decimal. And then remember, you, you use that E, so you hit that second blue button, and then right above the seven, there's a comma, and mine has two blue E's. That E, is the times 10 so that way you don't have to enter that and then after it you just put the exponent and see this is one way to actually test your answer to see if it's right you can also have small numbers so let's say I have times 10 to the negative third so 1.56 I would move the decimal one two three spaces to the left so this would be 0 0.00156. So make sure that you can go back and forth between these, that you can go from, so if I was to get this back into scientific notation, I would go one, two, three, because I want the decimal here to only have one number uh, in that spot. So 1.56 times 10 to the 
times 10 to the, I moved it three times and this is a small number, so it would be to the negative third. So make sure you can go back and forth between scientific notation to standard notation, which is a regular number, and a regular number in standard notation into scientific notation. Um, also, we had the significant figures. So I always remember Atlantic um, absent. So if this is your number, this is the United States, Atlantic absent, Pacific present. So if you have a number that does not have a, um, just making up a number here, 1000, I don't know, that doesn't have a decimal, so there's no decimal point here, you would start on the left hand side, the Atlantic side, and the first number you come across that is not zero, you count that as significant. So this would only have one significant figure. If this had a decimal, you would start on the Pacific side, and the first number you come across that's not zero, you count that as significant, and everything after it as significant. So this would have one, two, three, four, five significant figures. So that decimal makes a huge difference, you know? Um, having that decimal point, um, in this case, I have five significant figures, versus when I didn't have it, I only had one. So remember, Pacific present, um, Atlantic absent. And then lastly, I wanna talk about relationships. So there's two types of relationships. Um, we're gonna talk more about these um, later a lot. So a direct relationship on a graph looks like this. Basically, as this variable is increasing, um, this variable is also increasing. As this variable decreases, this variable also decreases. Versus an inverse relationship, um, as we're going up on this side, we're increasing in numerical value. So I don't know, we have 1, 5, 10, 15. And then here we have, so 0, 5, 10, 15. As you're going this way and we're increasing in value on uh, for this variable, notice that on for this variable, on the y-axis, you are decreasing. So this would be an inverse relationship. As one variable increases as you go this way, uh, this variable is decreasing. Uh, in the second video that I will make, I will go over density in terms of the concepts and the calculations.